Right, I think we better get started, or I might get in trouble with Simon for running over time. <laughs> so, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've all had a really, really good lunch uh, and enjoyed the morning so far, as I have. Um, my name's Funke Abimbola. Uh, my job title, as you can see, this is my official day job. It's actually nothing to do with DNI at all. I'm actually general counsel and company secretary for Roche, which is the world's largest biotech company. And my diversity work is done outside of, of my day job. It's done in the evenings, using up annual leave, and so on. I'm going to talk you through my personal story because it really begins to explain some of the issues we have uh, within the legal profession as a whole, but I'm focusing quite specifically on law firms and some of the challenges I've had and what I'm doing, actually, to help firms to improve some of their practices uh, to have a more diverse talent pool. For those who are on Twitter and would like to tweet, if you're that way inclined, that's my Twitter handle. So please do tweet away if you want to. And as I've just touched on, I wear a number of different hats. So my day job is being a senior lawyer and leader within Roche. But I do all these other things as well. I do lots of public speaking. I'm a diversity champion campaigner. I'm a mentor. I really enjoy supporting our youngsters and you know, people coming through the pipeline. Uh, I'm a sponsor, so I look, actively look for opportunities for people, uh, jobs, work experience, and so on. Uh, the most important role of all is I'm a very, very proud mother. I'm the mother of a 14-year-old boy. Even saying that, I find quite incredible. Um, but here's the proof that I am a mum because people often find it quite difficult to associate the woman who's standing in front of them uh, as being someone who does stand around rugby pitches and has coached her son's rugby team and so on. That's my son. Uh, I have his clearance to put this picture up as well. So, you know, I do have his permission. Very, very proud of being a mother. Now, Funke Abimbola is not a, an English name. Uh, I'm actually what I describe as British Nigerian. I was actually born in Nigeria and moved to the UK when I was eight. What was happening in the 80s was there was a massive oil boom in Nigeria. And my father was a doctor, so I come from a privileged middle class background. He did very, very well at the time. And what was happening with the middle classes was that a lot of people were able to fairly comfortably afford to send their children to the UK uh, to be privately educated, which is something that in many ways I probably would struggle to do now for my son. But at the time, it was quite affordable uh, for my father to do that. So across we came. I was educated in the UK, and I got to the age of 16. I just finished my GCSE, so just picture the scene, everyone. I'd done three sciences at GCSE because my father's a doctor, and the expectation was that I do medicine. He's not the only doctor in the family. So my mum's also a doctor, and my three younger siblings are all doctors. I have aunts, uncles, cousins, you name it. We're a medical family. The expectation was, as the eldest child, that I would also follow suit. I mean, let's just remember, my dad had spent a lot of money educating me privately uh, in the southern home counties, so it wasn't an unreasonable expectation. Unfortunately, I knew from the age of about 10 that not only did I not want to become a doctor, but I really wanted to become a lawyer. This was a real issue for my father, so I kept it quiet and hidden for as long as I could, even going as far as doing three sciences at GCSE to throw him off the scent because I was so scared he'd stop paying my fees if he found out I didn't want to do medicine. But when I had to choose my A-levels to let my dad know at that point that actually, you know, I, I don't want to become a doctor and all hell broke loose. Proud African father, high expectations, spending lots of money educating me and so on. He was very, very betrayed and my school teachers had to get involved and intervene and, you know, in the end, he agreed to let me do this thing called law. That's how he actually described it at the time. But he said the only condition was that I had to become one of the top lawyers in the country. So I thought, okay, I'll do it. Keep paying for my fees, Dad. Thank you very much. So off I went to Newcastle Law School. I did very, very well at school. Now, this is all very relevant to what I'm going to tell you later on around why I do so much around diversity. Newcastle University is a, is a Russell Group University. It's a really good law school. I did really well. I had the strong grades. I, I you know, got my law degree, got a good degree. So I thought, I, I'm, I'm away here. You know, I've got everything in my favour. I went back to Nigeria for what I thought was going to be a summer holiday after graduation. Now, this happens quite a lot in Nigerian families, where you go home for the summer 
and you never come back to the UK because the family descends on you and you're emotionally blackmailed and controlled in society. So I stayed for three years, you know, expecting to stay just for the summer. And it was very difficult to get a training contract in the UK, which would have been the next stage in my vocational training. So I decided to do the Nigerian bar, all with a view to returning to the UK, doing the transfer test, which is what you can do once you've, once you've qualified overseas. So I came back, did the transfer test. I applied to the law societies to try and reduce the two-year training contract because I'd gained valuable experience in Nigeria. And they agreed to reduce that down from two years to six months. So I thought I was well ahead of the game at this point because all my peers at Newcastle Law School were still struggling to get anywhere near training contract offers. They still had to find the two years. I only needed six months. Now, this was the first time I became acutely aware of my race. So until now, of course I knew I was black, but I never thought about it as being a barrier. I never thought about my name being a barrier on an application form. But believe you me, finding the six months experience was almost impossible. And the only thing I could put it down to was my name. I was comparing myself to my peers and they were progressing far quicker than I was with the same sorts of applications. Bearing in mind I only needed six months and not the full two years as well. You would think it would be easy, but it wasn't. In my desperation, I conducted what I call the cold calling campaign because I wanted to become a corporate lawyer. And a recruiter actually said to me that um, black women don't become corporate lawyers from care. It's far too competitive. You need to think about immigration or another area that's more conducive to your ethnic background. And I was enraged by this. I drew up a list of the firms I wanted to work for. And I found out the names of all the team leaders in those firms. And I cold called each and every one. Often the head of the corporate team was also the senior partner of the firm. These were large firms in the UK, some of which some of my colleagues here have worked for in the past. And I had this sales pitch about myself. This is what I could offer and so on. But it actually worked because I, I suspect probably because on the phone, they probably couldn't tell I was black. So, you know, it wasn't until I showed up at the interview that they suddenly realized that, oh gosh, she actually is a black woman. Um, but I certainly don't sound black on the phone. I think that's why that worked where my, my name on the CV possibly didn't work quite as well. So I managed to get the six months experience working with Wembley PLC, very, very large, fully listed company. And I've been admitted as a solicitor since 2000, so over 16 years now. So my career to date, Wembley PLC, two central London law firms. My career was ticking on, I was doing really, really well. And then what happened? I was married at the time. What happens when you've been married for a couple of years? Along came this little guy. Now, this little guy is the young man you saw earlier on. Again, I have his permission to put this picture up. <laughs> but this is my son when he was about nine months old. I had no concept of how having children was going to affect my career. I just decided to have a baby. I was 28. I was married. Returned from maternity leave to find out that I was the only 28-year-old who decided to have a baby. Literally, in the whole of central London law firms. Um, I was the first person to ask to work flexibly in my firm. The whole history of the law firm, no one else had had the courage to ask to work flexibly. And it just didn't work because I was a transactional lawyer and it was very difficult. So in the end, I left London altogether, moved to regional law firms for about six years. And then I joined my current organisation, Roche, almost five years ago in a role they called managing counsel, looking after the legal team. And I was very lucky, you know, I worked very hard for the promotion, but I was promoted to general counsel towards the end of last year. So this is why the diversity piece is so important. It's really important I tell my personal story because otherwise it's actually quite difficult, I think, for people to understand why I feel so passionately about this. But I do my work around race and gender in particular. But increasingly, I do a lot of work around social mobility. In fact, the award I won earlier was for a report on that very, very issue, because that's the ultimate leveler when we look at a barrier to entry, it's that sort of poverty barrier, if you like, and how that can be quite indicative and limiting what your prospects are. And certainly the law is, is like that, unfortunately, and my report says that. And I always sort of talk about Mary Kay Ash, because she talked about how there are three types of people in life those who make things happen, those who watch things happen, and those who wonder what happened. Now, when we're talking about diversity and inclusion, to really have impact, 
You need to be someone who makes it happen. You can't be watching on the sidelines and, or wondering what's happened. Or there's actually a fourth category of people who don't even know anything's happened at all, you know, who are blissfully ignorant of what's going on. So I'm acutely aware of this sense of responsibility to make it happen. And these are some of the examples of the things I've done that have had real impact within the legal profession. So I've signed up to the Law Society's procurement protocol, which means I've committed to only working with those law firms that have diversity and inclusion at the core of what drives them. So you can be technically excellent and not get onto my external legal panel. It's something I'm very, very vocal about, and I encourage others to do the same. I do a lot of work with the Women Lawyers and Ethnic Minority Lawyers Division, building up confidence mainly, networking, visibility, things like that. I'm a board member of Aspiring Solicitors, which is a very large platform for diversity within the legal profession. I'm a board member of uh, Women in Law London, which is a large, ne large network for women uh, who are lawyers in, in the London area. I'm part of the first 100 years, which is a celebration of 100, 100 years of women in law. I've been involved with the LAMI review as well because of lots of social mobility issues that lead to the lack of trust uh, in the criminal justice system and some of the challenges we're having around that. And this is the report I mentioned earlier. This is one I'm really, really proud of because the impact of this report, and it's available online as a PDF, has been tremendous. It's been inspiring for school children, youngsters who feel otherwise that actually they're not going to succeed purely because they're born into maybe a working class or otherwise socially disadvantaged background. So look it up, it's full of personal stories across the whole of the legal profession. Top judges were interviewed, people were really pouring their hearts out. I felt really privileged to get their stories recorded in this way. So this is what I try and convince law firms to do. And again, it's based on my experience. Supporting women returners and minority lawyers in, back into work and helping them with confidence issues, networking and visibility. Big, big hurdles around that really affects retention and affects promotion prospects. Setting targets rather than quotas, there's a big difference. Targets are a goal that you're working towards. A quota in my mind needs to be filled and that leads to resentment and all sorts of misunderstandings. Broadening access at entry level uh, for those who are from less privileged backgrounds, looking at broader universities to recruit from, so outside the Russell Group, not just that exclusive group of top universities in the UK. Agile working for men and women. I have a several male mentees who want to leave at five to go and pick the kids up from nursery. So it's not just about the women wanting to do this. Good quality childcare is important. I had an au pair living in for several years to help me with childcare, and that's the reality of it. Uh, mentoring, sponsorship, coaching, and transparency of data. So that report on social mobility had a survey, the results of a survey that we conducted across multiple diversity strands, looking at what firms were doing to support diversity, looking at the diversity programs at different stages of the talent pipeline within the law firms as well. So it's all there for everyone to read. So that's a very, very quick whistle-stop tour of why and how you can have impact. I think personal experience does really drive you. And it, you know, I make a lot of sacrifices on my personal time to fit this all in on top of a very hectic role. But it's because of the personal experiences I've had and I've seen other people have. That's what really, really gets me up and makes me, makes me do this. I'll just finish by mentioning Roche, the organization I work for, because I was really proud to work on this report this year. Uh, we have an incredible diversity profile within the UK. We have more female than male leaders. We have a huge commitment to social mobility. So about half of our staff are the first in their families to get a degree. And that's purely flowed from actually investing in talent and wanting to have diversity of thought, because that's fundamental to being an innovative industry such as ours. Very, very simple concept, but somehow it seems quite difficult for other organizations to understand. We have a huge representation of nationalities as well, and that's driven into the success of our contribution in the UK. Directly linked to that diversity of thought is us maintaining our competitive edge and doing the best that we can for our patients. We're a large healthcare company. So there is a business case here, and it's something that I talk about all the time, and it is really, really compelling. So that's me done. If anyone has any questions they'd like to ask, I think I've got time for questions. I'm open for questions now. Thank you. How did, it, how did you feel? How did you feel when they, you realized your, your name and your heritage was holding you back? 
your, your name predominantly? I was really shocked because it was the first time I'd experienced anything like that. And I was very upset. So I do remember crying <laughs> for a day, you know, literally. And then I got very, very angry, especially when the recruiter said what he said about, women, you know, black things, corporate law. And I thought, I'm going to prove you wrong. So I thought, right, this is the reason why I've got to succeed. So I turned it around. It became like the fuel for me to make a real success of it. But I was livid. I was insulted. I felt really hurt, really wounded. You can't change your heritage. I mean, that's who you are. Because uh, I've got examples now of um, <clears throat> predominantly uh, from, from Indian heritage that mm. uh, fathers are given their daughters English names. Yes. Yeah. I had a student yeah. come up to me after I did a talk at a school recently, uh, African Heritage, who told me that there had been a massive issue in the family because she decided to change her name by deed poll for that very reason. She was so concerned about jobs, and I think I managed to convince her not to do it. But it does happen. It does happen because it's seen as a real barrier. Very, very sad. Tunde, apart from the recruiter you talked to, was there anybody else you talked to? <laughs> I mean, you must have had some... Yes. Uh, did you feel <laughs> completely on your own, or did you not feel that, that um, I've got, I'm, so other people must have had the same experience? Yes, yeah, so I spoke to others who were of colour, you know, within the BAME, uh, you know, ethnicity, if you like, and their experiences, they were experiencing similar. Interestingly, my West Indian friends with English-looking names didn't have the same barrier, certainly in terms of getting the foot in the door. And would then, you know, arrive at reception and people would look shocked that it was them. Um, but I, hadn't, I was mistaken for a secretary once when I was being interviewed. You know, the receptionist said I, I didn't realise he was looking for another secretary. I said, I'm not here for the secretarial role. So I did talk to people and I suppose people were trying to protect me as well. Maybe that was an element of it to sort of lower my expectations so I didn't disappoint myself and my aspirations and so on. But yeah. The, the general consensus was that as a black woman, immigration was probably a better route, a high street firm rather than corporate. We were talking about 1998, 1997. Yes, late 90s. So, I mean, we aren't where we are today. We aren't where we are today, thankfully, with some movement. But mm. um, uh, you, you, were, you were clearly one of the cutting edge and, and pioneers of this. I challenge in this area regularly, so if that makes me, <laughs> if that makes me a pioneer, uh, thank you very much for <laughs> describing me as such, but uh, thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, question. Does your, I mean, I think it's brilliant that your, your day job gives you, you know, you're here today, where you'd normally presumably you'd be on your day job. Do you carry your diversity work back with you all the time into your day job? And are you making impacts in your day yes, job I as am. a result? I am, but we're at a very different stage within my organisation. I mean, we've got a very diverse talent pool, robust succession plans to maintain that and so on. So what I'm doing is actually supporting on the global policy for those affiliates overseas that may not be where we are in the UK. But the UK is seen as a real flagship uh, for having gotten this right. Uh, again, it's not core cool to my role, but I partner with HR and others and the global head of diversity and inclusion, who's based in America, regularly advising on different affiliates. <laughs> Mine is more of a comment than a sure. question, um, and very well done to some of the work that you, Thank know, you. you have been doing in this area. Um, it's a very personal story and is one that resonates with me and I know we're in 2016 and mm. it's different from 1998 but I don't think that we've moved on very mm. much from where we were in 1998 mm. because I do know of people that do still have this problem with yes. um, names yes. and wanting to change CVs just as uh, mm. my colleague mm. there said. It happens. Thanks. It's funny you mentioned the Law Society because that's the first time when I obviously the work I, I was doing, we were bidding it and I went in there and I saw the celebration of BAME plastered everywhere for, uh, um, uh, and I, I saw the case studies and, and I thought, 
I can replicate that. Mm. And it's funny that you, you mentioned that and the, yes. the, they've yes. been incredible. It's amazing. Really, really incredible. It is amazing what the Law Society is doing. a template for a lot, of, a lot of industries to follow. Yeah. In my, it, it's in my it's incredible what the Law Society, and I work, I've worked with four successive presidents now around this agenda, and the level of commitment is extraordinary. It's something that's taken very, very seriously. So I'm glad that you've noticed that as well. Um, and I feel very privileged, frankly, to be in a position to help because the presidents would otherwise struggle to know where to start with what can be quite a complex issue. If, if we're being quite honest. Certainly around race, I think gender is slightly easier to try and deal with in some ways, but race is very sensitive, so they do need guidance, and I'm very happy to help. <laughs> yes? Uh, it's just a quick comment, just to say that I'm really proud of you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank just you. sitting here hearing your story Thank is, you. um, is amazing. Thank and you. I think you're a role model for, for our generation, if I put it that way. Thank you. Um, hopefully, we... Uh, I'm just going to be inviting you to the London Borough of Bakken and Dagenham. Because <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have the Women, um, Women Month in the, March, in the month of March next sure. year. And I'm also already putting together names <laughs> of speakers. So you actually fit into that one. So. <laughs> and there's an invitation. I'll be contacting you soon. <laughs> I couldn't possibly turn that down, could I? <laughs> Sorry, for those who don't know, I'm, I'm a councillor in London Borough, back in Dagenham, and I'm the cabinet member for Equalities and Cohesion and past mayor of the borough. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the kind invitation. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just going to make a, a comment here, and sure. I, just, I would be interested in your take on it. So much of what we do in Diversity World is about images that we present, and we're talking about positive role models. Mm. I'm noticing on the screen that your white male image on q and <laughs> I'm wondering whether or not there are, I mean, I don't know, I'm asking whether mm. or not there are black female images that could do the same thing, and would it give the audience a different, a different message? I'm just, I'm That's just wondering, a very I, think, valid point. I think that we should be wherever possible, wherever mm. we're creating an image, m change the images that we're using. That's a fair um, point. And just because you've said that, I will change that image. Did, that's a fair yeah. point. All right, sorry. I, 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 not, not at all. I'm, I'm always open to feedback, as you can tell. That's, that's a really valid point. Thank you. <laughs> One of the things we recognized is that, um, and most of our recruitment is at graduate level, mm. um, uh, the value we now uh, achieve from taking names off CVs yes, blind CVs. and taking uh, university mm. names mm. off CVs. Uh, overall, we have found, since we've done that, a higher standard of final recruitment mm. than we, we were operating at yes, before. Yes, yes. Because you tend to then attract people who are really resilient. That's what ends up happening when you broaden the scope out and look at people purely on merit. It's those who have the resilience and tenacity to actually, who are hungry, really hungry for the, for the role. That, and that's fantastic quality for a lawyer. And contextual recruitment is also very, very big now. Uh, there's a tool that an organization called Rare Recruitment has, which helps to, again, throw up candidates that would otherwise be lost to law firms. So that's commendable that you're doing that. Thank you. Right. I have to stop because there, I have some more uh, colleagues who are presenting. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.